Hi, this is Liam Howlett from The Prodigy, and you're listening to Mark Vick. Keep it locked. <laughs> After a debut album that sold 190,000 copies, The Prodigy are back. And we have Liam Howlett, the mastermind behind this force live. How are you, Liam? I'm good, thanks. Cheers. Yeah. Excellent. How does it feel to be back in Australia after your massively successful first tour? Um, really good, actually. Really pleased to back, be back here and um, just playing all the new music to everyone. You know, it's really cool. September 1992 saw the release of the debut album, The Prodigy Experience. Um, featured all the hits and more. How long did it take to put together the album and how long had it been planned for after, the, say, the first single? Um, well, after the first single, I wasn't into doing an album at all because I, I felt that an album was too much of a commercial venture for the prodigy um, but of course I didn't know then we were going to have um, sort of like success with Charlie and everybody in the place and singles like that mm. um, we had so many singles from the album eventually too didn't that's we? right and I wasn't really into that was, that was more of a record company thing yeah. um, but the thing was with the album um, it took me it takes usually about six months to put an album together it took me six months to do the, this new one six months to do experience and the reason why we decided to do an album is like I've written so much music and um, with the dancing it changes so rapidly you have to um, I had to get the material out as soon as I could and so we decided right let's put this album together um, we didn't know how it was going to go because it's sort of like almost like one of the first albums of that t style you know it's, we had a few that um, sort of shut up and dance and stuff like that you know that come mm. out of London but um, there wasn't really that many actual bands from the rave scene doing albums you know and we thought well let's give it a go now you're touring around Sydney, Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane um, you've already played Canberra and Perth how was the response there compared to last time? really really good it's, I mean Perth was just amazing we had um, 3,000 people in a warehouse um, and it was just like an English gig really it was just really really good response crowd, crowd were really good mm. um, had a really good time met some really cool people and just had a party really it's just really good and uh, how was the new album music received? Um, very good actually, because it's um, it's quite interesting to listen to for the first time, especially tracks like um, Voodoo People, which is sort of like yeah, quite sort of like in your face. It's got guitars and stuff in it, and it's I don't know. I felt that um, we played the new tracks in England quite a bit, and we just sort of like know they go down quite well. Mm. Um, that's so. why we try and have a mixture of old stuff as well, though, so people don't feel totally lost, you know. Now, the new album sees a slight departure from the Prodigy of 1992, as we would know. Um, the album, Music for the Jilted Generation, is released here in Australia on July the 4th. Liam, why the title? Um, the reason why we chose that title is because <clears throat> I think the, um, the Jilted Generation is the people have been brought up and dance music, and... Um, in England, um, we're going through big problems at the moment with the police and the government who are trying to close down all the parties, the whole party scene and basically stop young people having a good time. So it's kind of like the jilted generation is, you know, thousands and thousands of people who um, have been brought up on like this corrupt, meant to be this corrupt music, do you know what I mean? It's meant to be drug related, it's meant to have involved in the bad acid house scene and stuff like that and it's just it makes me laugh and that's why we decided to call the, the album of that title after reading the sleeve of the one love single yeah and uh, your views on rave there um how have things changed in england since then a year ago um they've gotten worse actually yeah. the police can now actually stop right a, a group of five people um a convoy of five cars whether they're going to their nans for dinner whether they're going to the beach doing whatever if they think they're going to a rave they've got the power to stop them and split them up and send them in different directions because yeah, they think kidding. they might be going to a rave and search the cars it's just crazy do you know what I mean they've got so much power now but you, you, they just can't stop the parties because they're so big that um I don't think they can stop them, personally. Well, they forced them back underground now, haven't they? That's right. I mean, the whole scene has gone back into the clubs, which I actually prefer, because mm. it's much more intense. When you're playing a club to, like... Um, I mean, they've got big, quite big clubs in England where sort of, like, 2,000 people can get in and um, that type of size of venue. You mm. know, it's much more of an intense thing than doing stuff that's, like... It's really good to do, like, a party for 10,000, but um, you get much more of a, an intense atmosphere with a smaller venue. OK, well, back to the album. Um, certainly shows a new side to the prodigy from the first track entitled Intro. So, I've decided to take my work back underground. To stop it falling into the wrong hands.
But what's the notion behind that one? Um, <laughs> I don't know really. I'll just, I guess, the kind of like the first 30 seconds just um, sums up the whole feel of that whole new album. It just sets the mood for the whole album and basically gives you an idea. You know, it just says we're taking their work back underground, and I think the second album is a much more grown-up sound, a much more sort of like tighter, more underground feel than the first. The first album was um, kind of like a collection of hits in a way. By the time we've had, by the time the experience had come out, we'd released so many singles of it, and I kind of regretted doing that because I, I like albums where you can, you know, you, you recognise most of the tracks, but I don't like almost like greatest hits albums become a bit I don't know that's probably why you remix some of them isn't it yeah that's right I mean the first album was um, good for its time and um, I'd never sort of like put it down or anything but I think I'm really pleased with the second album it seems to be a much more of a grown up sound and um, I'm really into it ok track 2 soon cracks in with the familiar prodigy breakbeat it's called Break and Enter now what gave you the idea to record such a rebellious track um, basically you know um, the title of the album The Jilted Generation um, the whole thing is because the, the original re album cover was going to be um, a police hat on fire um, which is kind of like a real controversial cover you know but we didn't want to get too heavy so what we decided to do is make the album look like it's kind of like um, well, one of the original ideas was to make it look like they were the actual titles of the tracks were offences like you know if you've got an offence in England called break and enter which is like when you break into a house and mm. steal from you know something out of a house whatever you know we were going to call each track like a, an offence like I don't know what the other tracks were going to be called but you know that type of idea and basically it just it kicks in with a, a kind of like a, a real strong first track that um, grabs your attention straight mm. away you know the second one you've worked with the indie band Pop Believe Itself that's right the next yeah. track. that's an interesting combination um, how do you get together with them for their law yeah I mean I've always I really really have got into guitar stuff now only because I've seen so many similarities between um, guitar music and techno that um, the, the it has the same kind of energy on stage, you know, you watch a live rock band, even though they're not obviously not playing guitars and drums and techno, um, it has the same sort of like energy on stage and sort of like um, the whole vibe of the band is pretty similar to a techno band. And that's why I wanted to try and collaborate on this album, you know, guitars and um, the techno thing, because I don't think it's been done that well so far. And um, that was the sort of like feel behind that track. Also, that this track is also the only sort of like political track on the album um, even though the version on the album is quite an instrumental track if we're going to release that as a single more vocals yeah it will have obviously more vocals in it to explain that their law is obviously to do with the law in England on the on the party scene now this next one Poison yeah. interesting track seeing your first return to hip hop since you were in the uh, guru cut to kill yeah that's right tell us what um, sort of influences in hip hop what, what were you into uh, you know a couple of years ago tell us about that um, well I was always into the more underground hip hop bands I think when I've ever been into bands they've always been um, I don't know I wasn't really ever into Public Enemy as such I was into their first album I thought their first album was wicked um, but as soon as they got a bit bigger I, I don't know I was always into the more underground stuff like I was, my favourite hip hop band ever was Ultra Magnetic MCs um, I just love their music love the lyrics and everything and I mean, I must admit, I like Snoop Doggy Dog and Dre, but um, the, the idea behind the Poison track was, I didn't want to do a track where it was just a rap all the way through. I mean, it's got, it is still quite a techno-y track with mm. techno overtones and stuff, but it's it's got the feel of a kind of like hard hip, slow hip hop song. Um, well, Maxim's voice is um, on there for the first time, yeah. um, apart from Death of the Prodigy, Dancers Live, yeah. where he's emceeing. Is that sampled or live? It sounds sampled to me. Yeah, it is sampled. I mean, we, we got him into the studio, um, and I played around the voice on the sampler quite a bit and um, I got something I was happy with, you know, I was, I was pleased with it. We couldn't really do it live because um, the way I work in the studio, I don't run to tape, you know, and um, we have to sort of like sample the lyrics and put them down like that, you know. OK, you've got your new single out here in Australia and the UK right now. It's called No Good Start the Dance. Yep. And uh, great song. You seem to have rejuvenated a well-used female vocal sample. I think I remember it from Hit House, Jackson the Sound of the Underground. Yeah, everyone says that, but I can't remember it from that. You know? Oh, right. Well, you've turned it into something startling new again. Was it an obvious choice for the first single? It's the first single in Australia anyway. I know yeah. One Love was in England. Yeah, I mean, the, the way I look at it, it's kind of like the first single from the album because I, I did One Love about um, a year ago and kind of, I really don't want to release too many singles off this album because I don't want it to turn into like, just another sort of like greatest hits album thing. But um, I mean, the choice of using 
um, Start the Dance as a single was kind of like, um, I think personally the main single off the album is probably going to be Voodoo People, for me, one of my favourite tracks. And so what we tried to do is we tried to delay, um, because the album was taking a long time to write, we thought we'd put um, Start the Dance out just to sort of like kick it in slowly. And then by the time Voodoo People comes out, we'll follow it up with the album. So it should um, fit in quite nicely now. Um, we've had some really good remixes done by, um, well it's just one remix done by the Dust Brothers who are brand new oh, yeah, out from, from London. They're doing some really good stuff at the moment. They've done all um, real good underground bands like um, the Sandals. Um, I don't know, they've done Underworld and stuff like that and they're just really, really good. Um, and they, they're they really clever the way they combine hip-hop with um, techno. And that's kind of like a brand new sound for England, I think, at the moment. So we can expect the uh, singles to release in order. Um, no, uh, One Love, No Good, then Voodoo People, then Their Law? Uh, possibly Their Law. We're still talking about that. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see it as a single just because it's so such an off-the-wall track. OK, well, um, also on the album is One Love, obviously, and uh, it's a shame that didn't get a local release here because there's a great Johnny L mix on the 12-inch. Yeah, I can't believe that. I mean, America didn't want to release it either, but mm. um, kind of Electra. Um, we're not on Electra anymore in America. We're um, looking for a new record deal. Right. We've got a few people interested in this, but I, I don't think Electra did that much of a good job because they're so big that we kind of got lost amongst the... Um, the bigger bands and they didn't really have much time they didn't know how to mm. market this music and um, they didn't want to release One Laugh because they didn't feel you know it was right for America but I just you know it was really bad it was a bad thing and they, um, they missed out there So you're playing tracks from the new album uh, Music for the Jilted Generation Yeah we're doing the whole set consists of like a few new ones um, and a few old ones just so people you know, can relate to what we're doing. You know, we play, we still play out of space I and mean, a couple of other old ones. So, you know, when we go on the set, there's not a, a total new range of music that no one's heard before, you know? Well, out of space was probably your most successful single here in Australia. The other successful ones were probably Charlie and Everybody in the Place. You've been those in as well? Um, we don't do, do Charlie anymore, actually, because um, it's so old now and we just want to, because we've got so many new pieces of music we want to play. Mm. Um, we try not to do too much old stuff, you know, you have to balance it out properly, but we, we don't do it, um, Charlie or everybody in the place anymore. OK, now if we go back in time to February 1991, the Prodigy released their first 12-inch, What Evil Lurks. What conceptions, ideas brought together the Prodigy Collective in the first place? The thing was, when we first started, we were so into, so into the sort of like hip-hop scene and stuff. Um, I really liked um, the acid scene in London and sort of like the techno scene and I, I could really see a fusion between the two. A lot of people were doing the hip-hop dance into this music and um, what I saw in the clubs were people seemed to be really into the, the techno songs that had a slightly more dancey beat to them and um, I just knew that um, the balance between the hip-hop rhythms and um, the techno sound would come out on top you know and um, you know when we first started we we didn't expect to become that big at all, you know. You know, we still, we still don't really. We just do what we do, you know, and we just try and, um, you know, keep level-headed about it. The whole thing, you know. So it was just you in the first place, and the other three guys joined in as you went along. Or? Yeah, but when we first started, it was just me. Um, I signed to XL Recordings yeah. um, on my own. I think it was February 1991. Um, the first record was released on March, and um, in January of that same year, we. Um, I met the other three of the members of the band and we just got together just purely for sort of like fun to begin with, just sort of like say, yeah, let's get together, mm. do a few shows and off it went. So uh, basically to most Australians, Charlie was the first we heard of the prodigy. Yeah. Um, did you expect such a hit with that? I guess you say um, you did it just for fun to start with. What about with uh, with Charlie? That was the second EP. Yeah, I mean, same with that really. We never went out of a way to get any success. It's just like... I think the main thing to remember is people just don't understand how big the, the rave scene and dance scene is in England and um, you know it's like you can survive um, and have success just by being an underground act and I think that's what, what's happened with us even though we sell bucket loads of records in England we still manage to um, play at all the underground parties still just because the scene is so big with this, you know it's got to be like 500,000 people going out every weekend to clubs and stuff just like so big um, there's big parties going off every, all the time and I don't know we just managed to um, you know to hang on to what we've got now you're a classically trained musician how would you describe the prodigy sound um Hard dance sound, really. I don't really like to categorise um, the prodigy as being like breakbeat techno, junglism, whatever. You know, I, I don't really like to categorise it. If, it. if it's a good record, it's a good record. And I think that uh, the prodigy is a hard dance act. You know, we can, 
you know, because some tracks are, are more um, ambient than others, some are more harder techno bass, some are more breakbeat, you know, so it's kind of like quite musical, I'd say, in some some tracks. Um, say, for example, the new album, there's um, a mixture of different styles on the album. You've got um, some hip-hop influence on there, more than the first album. Um, not actual rapping as such, because I'm not so in, much into the rapping side of things. I just like the, the hip-hop feel of a track, real laid-back, sort of like smooth. But most of the other tracks are quite sort of like hard and um, quite energetic, you know. The next single after Charlie was uh, Everybody in the Place, which was a huge number two hit. Uh, this also kicked off The Prodigy in America. How was that? Um, we've never actually made it, you know, sort of like that big in America. I mean, the rave scene it isn't really... Um, that big. I mean, it's, it's a big gay scene over there, um, and it's not really, um, I don't know, it's hard to explain. There's no real place where it's really, really happening for the more hardest type style of music. Um, and I don't know, we had a really good time and we did do some really good gigs, like Dallas was really good. Everyone there was well up for what we were doing. Um, but we're hopefully going to go back, just like we've done in Australia, we've come back like a year and a half later. And there seems to be a lot more people into it this time than the first time round. Um, hopefully that'll be the case with America as well, you know. Now Voodoo People's another track on the album, sampling um, a guitar, for, you've used That's a right. few of those sort of sounds on it. Yeah, but I'd just like to point out here that the, all the guitars and all the instruments on the album are actually live players, they're not samples. Especially Voodoo People. I tried to um, incorporate the sound of live instruments rather than, um, um, I tried to write it in a different way, that's what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to sort of like um, write a track without use of synthesizers, just sort of like using live instruments, you know, never written a track like that before and it's kind of like interesting sound. By the time people reach halfway through the album, um, the heat, the energy, they will have noticed the constant return of that acid in many of the new songs. Um, but Lee Roth and the band just didn't really like the acid scene when that was in it was more of a sort of like into soul and hip hop and stuff but I was I could see the energy behind the acid scene because it was so simple and it was just like um, but these really really simple acid tracks worked so well back in 1988 um, and I wasn't actually into the scene in 1988, I got into it in 89, but there was still quite a lot of acid stuff coming out of sort of like Detroit and London and stuff, and I was really into it. One of the earlier Prodigy tracks was an extra track on the 12-inch EP of Charlie. Now, Pandemonium just seems to catch that whole sound of 1991 rave. How come only a 12-inch extra track? Fantastic song. Yeah, I mean, I felt the same. I think the whole thing with the Charlie EP was, it was such a different variety of music. I mean, a lot of people said that Your Love could have been a single. I thought um, that would have been the A-side. Yeah, I mean, that, that particular track was, uh, I think, was even more popular in, in the rave scene than Charlie actually was itself. You know, the same with Pandemonium. Must thank Liam Hallett from the Prodigy. Thanks, Liam, for coming in. Thanks a lot, man. So good luck with the uh, new album, Music for the Jilted Generation, which everyone can pick up locally on July the 4th. Thanks a lot.